Welcome to SkyPod episode 3. I'm about to interview a Guinness world record holder. Don't go anywhere. Alright, well we're at 2,000 feet above eastern Arkansas and we're doing SkyPod episode number 3. My guests today are Bob Briggs and Julia Walker. How's it going, Bob? Good afternoon, Jason. Thank you for having me aboard. So is this three strikes and you're out? This is not three strikes and you're out. But okay. <laughs> well, I'm darn proud to be here with you at number three. I feel like a plank owner. Uh, it's my it's my <laughs> pleasure and honor. Uh, Bob does angel flights, uh, and Julia is his mission coordinator, and she's also working on her instrument rating. She's a private pilot and uh, working strong and steady towards that. So, uh, Bob, tell me briefly, what is an angel flight? Well, angel flight is a network of several different uh, geographic uh, charitable organizations, i.e., uh, angel flight uh, in our area, we're on the boundary of South Central, which is headquartered in Dallas. We're on the southern boundary of Central, which is headquartered in uh, Kansas City. We're on the western or eastern border of Oklahoma, it's uh, out of Tulsa. We're on the eastern border, or western border of SOARS, S-O-A-R-S, out of uh, Atlanta. All with the same mission. What they do is they funnel people that are either monetarily uh, uh, strapped and or uh, primarily because of medical issues. Um, COVID being a perfect example over there where they have uh, immune deficiencies, etc. And they just cannot either afford or their body can't afford to be in close proximity with people for normal airline flying and that kind of stuff. And so we get them to and from appointments and their treatments. You know, after learning how to fly myself, I can't really stand being around other people in a commercial plane either. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should just fly with you from now on. <laughs> well, we try to, we try to do this uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. We're taking two people that happen to live in Oxford. They're coming up to Memphis. I'm taking them to MD Anderson in Houston. Then we're positioning over towards New Orleans and picking somebody up at Slidell and bringing them back through Memphis, and somebody else is taking them to uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, excellent. And Julia, you're the mission coordinator, so what things need to be coordinated for the mission? Well, I work with, uh, tell the patients, go through the emergency procedures on the flight with the patients and show them where everything is, where the fire extinguisher is, about it's uh, pressurized, and about the oxygen, oxygen mask and how they work. I show them the um, emergency uh, checklist that we have and how to open the emergency doors and just be sure that they're comfortable and they're settled. And the good part is, with Julia with me, that there's a female portion or evolution that perhaps some sketchy pack passengers can feel more comfortable. Sure. We've had one or so that had uh, uh, difficulties with uh, her, her own body functions and why would she would not feel obviously comfortable talking to me where she certainly could with yeah, and did yeah, yeah. with Julia. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes I could sense. spend a little bit more time with the patients than Bob can just because he's pilot in command. <laughs> right. Well, that's pretty cool. So you work together. Do you have much to do with the uh, the flight planning and, the, and the, the course and that sort of thing, or is it more just behind the cockpit stuff? As a student, I will sometimes plan the flights, and Bob and I will compare how my flight planning compares to his. And so that's been good instruction for me. Um, and, and then he'll explain to me why he did certain things, as, you know, why we're flying at certain altitudes, and just the fuel planning, and just it's been an awesome experience, just from many different ways, just from being with the patients, and um, it's been just extremely rewarding from instructional basis as well as spending time with the patients and getting to know them. We've flown with some of my instructors and given them the opportunity to sit in the right seat. And some of them have never been to uh, flight level 410 or any flight level for that matter. And so this is a first time experience for them. And that's when I realized how special this is for me that's to right. have this opportunity. Well, yes. you're the envy of a whole lot of student <laughs> pilots, I can tell you that. But then again, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, good for you. Yeah, That's it's been a wonderful experience. That's and, great. And some of the patients I've stayed closer to than others and follow them on Facebook and stay in touch with them. That's great. So do you have any uh, especially memorable experiences with that? Oh, yes. We were down in Houston uh, on a Friday afternoon. It was around noon. And we were picking up a patient who happened to be from Memphis. We were busy getting settled in the, uh, we were at Hobby, at Wilson. The room was filled with people, and I didn't realize it at the time that the room was either filled with angel flight pilots or patients. But the husband of the wife that we were flying, uh, that was the patient, he walked in the room and he said, commanded the room, he said, I want everybody to say a prayer. And so he made everybody bow their heads and he said this wonderful prayer of healing. And then he had everybody say, happy birthday, sing happy birthday to his wife. Well, it was about two or three months later she passed away. Oh. And But it was after that, it just gave me chills and almost brought tears to my eyes because when we finished the prayer and we started singing happy birthday, that's when I realized, oh my gosh, these are either angel flight pilots or either they're patients. And that was extremely memorable. That's great. And the reason there were so many people there, Jason, is because MD Anderson is a big, big collector of cancer folks. And it's not like here in town, the St. Jude's, where they specialize on children. These are adult patients, and this is a huge, huge center of research and, and treatment for these yes. people. And okay. one other patient we flew, she happened to be uh, around the Pickwick area. And she and her husband drove over here, and she was 32, 33 years old, something like that, and had breast cancer. Wow. And she had, I followed her on Facebook, we flew her a couple times, and you would have never even known that she even had cancer, never even acted the least bit uh, sick or anything, just as sweet as she could be. And I followed her on Facebook, and I saw many comments, oh, it's so wonderful that Bob and the other Angel Flight pilots that she had flown with uh, did this because it gave her more time with her son, who was like one or two years old. Well, anyway, she passed, unfortunately, the same week that that other patient passed away. The whole thing was that we were able to give her more time with her son because she didn't have to drive, she didn't have to wait on commercial, just gave her more time. That's so far beyond the rewards of flying, just can't even imagine. Once, yeah. you're, once you're tired of the $100 or $300 hamburger, this gives some meaning to it as well. I have a personal feeling as well because my brother unfortunately died of leukemia before he reached age 17. Oh. So this is a payback for me. Goodness, that's and, and here's a saying that I'll never forget. These patients, you don't know them at all, but they're going to remember you for the rest of their lives. That's true. Wow. And there's, a, there's another patient that we flew several times. She used to go up to Oklahoma, but they closed that cancer center, and now she goes down into Georgia. And she reminded me to get one of my uh, routine tests because... She had not done that, and she reminded me that I need to do so, and the next time we flew her, I told her I did, and it was because of her. Wow. May I make it clear to the audience and anybody, especially not pilots, that are, this is a total charitable thing. There is no reimbursement whatsoever. The uh, It's giving up at the time, the airplane, if you happen to own it, or rent it, and your, your time, and... Uh, there, there is no reimbursement whatsoever. Uh, there's, that would fall into something close to 135 operations and FAA things for air taxi, and that just cannot be done. So it's it's a gifting of your talents, your time, and the airframe uh, towards this mission. Wow, that is a really incredible story. And again, I say, what an honor to have you in the airplane. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's, just, that's just so neat. I, only hope that I'm able to do the same thing uh, with, with mine one day. May so. I encourage you to do that and your listening audience as well because they are begging for assets to be able to do this. Okay. So somewhere, wherever you are in this country, there is an angel flight organization or something right. like it that will help. Right, and they, even if you don't fly, they're always looking for donations yes, as they well, are. too. <laughs> that too, okay. always. Okay, yeah. so that brings me to this. If I wanted to donate or... I wanted to be an angel flight pilot. Where do I find the information to do that? Every all you have to do is a Google search, and quite frankly, uh, there are so many organizations across the country. Again, I've named the ones that are happen around here, Tennessee and Arkansas. 
And if you just do an angel flight, you'll see what their geographic area is. And a questionnaire they have, Are you? do you live within these states? Do you do this, that, and the other? And you'll f soon find out that, that, that you, you'll pick the right one. In other words, something that's headquartered in the West Coast would not be applicable to where you are. Same thing for the East Coast. But the Southeast and the Central area, uh, I belong to nine different organizations. Oh, I see. So I, I string for a bunch of them. And, and the beautiful thing is, because of the seat capacity and weight, lift capacity of my airplane, I try to meld a couple trips at the same time. There's no sense flying one person sure. when I could haul six. Okay. And they're generally speaking going in the same direction. I see. So uh, I try to make it as efficient as possible. Okay. So what type of aircraft do you, do you well, use for this? I'm blessed in the last three and a half years to own after 47, six years of, of lusting for one. A, a Citation a CJ-1. It's a, nine, a 2001 model. So that's my 21-year-old girlfriend. I see. Uh, Julia is my beyond 21-year-old lady friend. <laughs> right. Oh, you're a smart Thank you. guy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrific. All right, so you're a two-time Tennessee Pilot of the Year. Uh, you flew with the Army Reserves and the Navy Reserves? Yes, sir. That's I know that's a strange thing. I flew helicopters in both services, and it was all reserve. Wow. And you were a flying tiger? Yes, sir. So you were personal friends with Claire Chennault? Uh, only in the history books. Oh, and unfortunately, okay. I neither got to meet uh, Ms. Chennault or Bob Prescott, who was the founder of the airline. He unfortunately died six weeks before I got hired. Oh, I see. Back when dinosaurs roamed right. the earth. Right, so we're talking about the Flying Tigers freight company, obviously, yes. Not, yes. The, not the guys who were in China. Yes, I have white hair, but I'm not quite that old yet. <laughs> right. yeah. And by the way, that, that Tennessee thing, uh, it, it, the pilot of the year, that was given by one of the many organizations, and, and they happened to be mid-Atlantic. They're headquartered out of Virginia Beach, and so they pick a, a pilot who has done more missions in each of the states that they that they uh, uh, that their geographic area uh, handles. So oh, I, I just happened to live in Tennessee, and I flew more missions in two years running than anybody else oh, did. Oh, gotcha. So okay. Well, the big zinger though is that you have a, a record in the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> That's just insane to me. I'm sitting next to a record holder, <laughs> and the record is 109 type ratings. Getting one is a pretty big deal. There are a lot of people that have got two, three, four. A few people have got 20 or 30, but 109? <laughs> well, some of us have nothing better to do, Jason. Right. Well, but there is nothing better to do. It, it is a passion. Uh, I didn't set out to set a record. It's just one of these things that's sort of, as I call it, a cottage industry that just sort of blossomed. I kept watering it, and it continued to grow. Right. Well, things tend to do that, right? And I've loved every minute of it. Uh... Certainly, I can't keep current on anything more than one or two at a time. Right. But I've had the opportunity to at least one time say with each one of those, I had my hands on the controls. I manipulated it the way I had to within the PTS, or now ACS, and I demonstrated pilot command uh, ability at least once. I see. Okay, so a question. Some, sure. of the v some of the viewers here are not pilots. Sure. So tell me, what is a type rating? Well, the FAA dis defines that you need to have a specific type. And that means 747, 727, 737, something like that, or the CJ series of aircraft. For any airplane that, first of all, we don't care what it weighs, if it's a turbojet-powered airplane. Okay. Secondly if it weighs over 12,500 pounds. Okay. Thirdly, if they find it, and it's rare, if it's so difficult in the eyes of the FAA that they say, nah, you have to demonstrate specific understanding and flight demonstration in this airplane because it is so difficult to fly. I see. Okay. So, so, in, <laughs> so in the driving world, uh, an analogy would be, I go get a driver's license and I can drive most any car, but if I wanted to upgrade to something like a bus or a semi-truck, I would have to have a higher class, but it seems to me like a type rating would be like if I wanted to drive a Kenworth as opposed to a Peterbilt. Is that a, an that, accurate that, analogy? That would be a great analogy, yes. Uh, uh, the... the 
the cross the board would be like single engine airplanes. Airplanes single engine land. They don't require a type rating. Right. Uh, airplane, but you can't do an airplane multi engine land until you get certified to do that. Right. But these are individual types and there's a there is an airworthiness or a certificate a uh, advisory circular that lists all of them. Right. There's about two hundred that exist. That's and, nuts. and the cool part is that I have some that don't any longer exist on the planet. Give me an example. Uh, well, there may be one constellation left in the uh, country here that's actually airworthy. It's up the Kansas City, I believe, in the Flag County folks. You've got Connie time. Yes. That is cool. That that and another one would be the Boeing Stratocruiser. Yeah. The 377. Right. It has a big round front. Yes. It was yep. like the B-29 nose. Yeah. Uh, those are cherishable to me because they've got big, round, fire-breathing machines that <laughs> right. <laughs> accelerate them. Right. And they were fun, and they are they are fewer than uh, than Hensteed. Wow. That's pretty cool. So I saw the uh, video with you and Dan Grider, and he had in his hand three or four cards <laughs> that it took to get all those type ratings on. Yeah, well, uh, yes, they're page one of, of three. So, page two of three. <laughs> so a pilot certificate, they say, is a an actual card like a driver's license, except it doesn't have a picture. So this guy's got three of them just to fit all his credentials on. I uh, don't see that very often. <laughs> What was the first type rating you got? Actually, it was back in the day when you could get, you can't do it anymore. There's, so I'm grandfathered. I'm just that old. Uh, a Bell 47 helicopter. Now, does it meet the criteria I just said? Is it over 12,500 no. pounds? Was it so difficult that you had to have it? No. Did but I do instruments in it, which is a requirement today? No. It wasn't equipped, nor was it certified to do so. But back in the day, at the airline transport pilot level, you would get a type rating in a small helicopter, even though it's limited to VFR. Wow. So that was the first. Why? Because you could get a helicopter type rating at 1,200 hours instead of the 1,500 hour uh, that was required for the ATP for the airplanes. I see. I've actually ridden in a Bell 47. Uh, and, and lived. If you don't know what a Bell 47 is, <laughs> if you've ever seen MASH, that's the helicopter that they used in the intro to MASH. Um, what was your last type rating? The 747-400. Wow, another beautiful airplane. The United stopped flying them. I'd been after that one for years. I had the luxury and the wonderfulness to be able to fly the 100 and 200 models, the three-person cockpit with Flying Tigers. But they collapsed the cockpit and made it a two-man crew when they when they updated the avionics in the late 90s, and I never had a chance to do it. Well, United stopped flying them, and before they tore their simulator down, I just had to capture that one. It was all in the box. So have I ever actually operated the airplane? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you got the type right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What fun to do. What was the most fun or memorable one? Oh, goodness. Uh, the most, How about this? Most difficult? that okay. I found at the time. Okay. And unfortunately, I think everybody would agree if we turn the clock back to 1993, when the airplane first came out, the MD-11 was a madhouse. Okay. Why is that? Well, because people that had pocket protectors actually designed the airplane and they weren't thinking about drivers. Uh, this is my nutshell. And quite frankly, it was so difficult with so many systems and so many things going on, they didn't want you to ever hand fly the airplane. Now they've gone way around about 720 degrees in that because proficiency was lost, etc. But the teachers didn't know all the systems either and all the nuances, and it was tough to teach. Wow. So for me, that was a bit now going through it later when everybody had learned how to teach it, it was a breeze. Plus, I was seeing an old friend. Ah, uh, but uh, back in the day, early days, there was there were more people that washed out not only at Federal Express but American and Delta as well. So you've got a hundred and nine. That is just not a round number. Are you going to get one more? <laughs> there... Well, uh, for the last three and a half years, Jason, I've been feeding my twenty-one-year-old girlfriend. Right. She was hungrier when she was 18. I see. And now she's grown up to this point. Right this moment, it's not in my foreseeable future as long as I can, and the insurance companies will allow me to maintain 
owning and operating this uh, CJ airplane. I gotcha. So I don't think so. You never say never. Right. <laughs> All right. And one last plug. You've sure. got a, um, you do a second in command uh, type rating in the CJ, is Absolutely. that right? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. I where do I get the info? Well, the first thing is you got to have a MasterCard. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Or, or you have a checking account with an ACH. You know, sure. Or whatever. <laughs> I'm and familiar. It works really well. Venmo. <laughs> Venmo is working. Venmo. Well too. Um, I am not a designated pilot examiner, but it's not required. If your listeners or any pilots want to take a look at what the requirements are, they can go to FAR 6155. Okay. And it lists what you have to have for a second command. So as an instructor and an owner of the airplane, I can endorse your training records and follow the FARs. And at the completion of the training, I sign your records and or do your IACRA after you fill out the forms and you take it to the FAA and said, I have the minimum qualifications of, I'm at least a private pilot, I have an instrument rating, and I have a multi-engine rating, not limited to centerline thrust. Would you mind putting this type rating on my certificate, please? I see. So you have the same full type certificate on your pilot certificate with little smaller font at the bottom that says second command only. Right. So what, if, what does somebody have to do to get that taken off? Uh, the, the pilot command would be much more thorough. It'd be a much more thorough thing. All we have to do flying-wise as a second command is do three unassisted takeoffs and landings. Okay. Do a full stop and engine out procedures. Okay. But uh, why? Well, go ahead, sir. Do you offer the, the pilot in command? No. I can't. I, uh, no. Uh, I'd rather not train that people that way, mainly because it's a sing my particular airplane is a single-pilot airplane. Insurance says, uh, and I wouldn't put myself in jeopardy sitting in the right-hand seat teaching somebody over there first time when many of the controls are not reachable off the right-hand seat. Oh, that makes Emergency sense. braking and sure. uh, some of the circuit breakers that are more important on the left-hand side. Sure. So it's perfect for a second command. Sure. And I, I, I insist, some people do it in a day or something like that, but I insist on three full days. We spend two full days with systems and touching and feeling and going through how the, the things work. And then we have the fun day of flying and everybody gets a chance. Everybody gets to watch everybody else do their first landing. The grins coming out of the, you know, the grooves of their mouths. Then we change seats. The next guy gets to do that. And we rotate through a couple, three times. And then finally found us up with the, the final landing of an engine out. Sounds like fun. Well, I really appreciate the two of you, Julia and Bob, for coming on the SkyPod. And I think we're going to turn this thing back around oh. and go back to West Memphis. It's been a pleasure. It Thank you. It has been. Oh, by the way, the website, if you want further information. Yes. Jet up and go. <laughs> Jet up and go. Jet up and go. <laughs> J-E-T-U-P with an N and on go. Okay. Jet right. up and go. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Got it, Bob. Thanks so much again. Oh, and uh, pleasure. We'll see you on the ground. I'm, I'm hoping that you do. <laughs> All right. We will. <laughs> Perfect day for flying, Jason. All right. Beautiful. Thank Thanks, you. Bob and Julia. Great. Thanks, Great everybody. Flying. Nice all to right. meet all of you yep. virtually.